And the great thing about the California Island Symposium is that we're able to bring together all these different very bright and dedicated people who are working over um, many different islands and also many different disciplines. And we can start talking about how these different things interact and what are some great collaborations that we could do for better understanding these islands. And are there some species or some ecosystems that are not doing well? And this is a wonderful event in that it's a cross-disciplinary uh, approach to conservation. We're hearing from archaeologists, biologists, botanists, and it's a really incredible experience for us to be able to listen to all of those experts and take from them not just what's happening, but also offering us future areas where we really need to be focusing our resources to protect uh, the environment in a, in a rapidly changing world. What's so important about this meeting is that it, uh, it brings researchers together to talk about what they're learning. But I think the other thing it does is it stimulates some new thought, is how do we look into the future? Because all these people come together and they start talking about what each is learning and how it builds that story even further. This place is becoming, I think, uh, internationally known as a, as a place of great intrigue but also a welcoming place to do science. Recently we've been holding this symposium about every four years and every symposium seems to grow. There's nothing like getting together face to face, which is what happens at the symposium. For this ninth symposium we have over 600 people gathered together who have all different types of interests regarding the islands and what happens at the islands in some ways also reflects what's happening in the greater world. And so the the California Island Symposium is a great time for us to sit back and to look at that, that bigger world and to talk with scientists who are researching what's going on and can help us understand um, some of the things that are happening. overwhelmed, <laughs> actually. Thank you very much, and thank you to the committee that, uh, that chose me. I'm, I'm, I'm really staggered. Uh, as Denise said, it, it really does uh, have special uh, resonance for me. I, I served for several years on the board of Nature Conservancy with John, and um, it was interesting. I, I, I chaired for several years the Science and Stewardship Committee of the Nature Conservancy Board, and uh, except for the scientists on the board, there weren't many scientists on the board, um, not many other board members were very interested in what we did. They always wanted to go to, meet, to, to the committees that dealt with big acquisitions and government relations and, and not with science and stewardship. But John, from the outset, came to every one of our meetings. He always asked questions. And he once, uh, uh, when I got to know him better, he, he told me that uh, he felt that, that uh, the acquisitions and the rest of the work TNC did, did it, it had to be founded on real science and scientific stewardship also, and that he felt that was really the heart of what Nature Conservancy did. He and his, uh, his wife, Mary Dell, uh, actually hosted a board meeting here in Santa Barbara, which is when I learned that an Arizona legislator could actually live in Santa Barbara. So uh, I'm, I'm deeply honored and very moved. Uh, OK, so I'm going to talk about invasive species on islands. I'll, I'll, I want to begin by um, emphasizing that this is a really very young field. Conservation biology itself is a very young field. Ecology among the life sciences is quite young, and invasion science or invasion biology is, is really very young. And it, it, people didn't even recognize <laughs> that there was such a thing as introduced species, much less invasive introduced species, um, until the 18th century. This is actually the first scientific uh, description of 
species that are not native found somewhere else. Uh, Pericom was sent by Linnaeus to the New World to see what was there, basically. And he, um, he recognized about 15 plant species that he knew to be European. And from the locations and the size of the uh, area where he found them, he, he deduced that they must have been introduced from Europe. And he wrote about, about this. And that's the first scientific description. Uh, nothing about impact, just that they're there. The, um, in the uh, 19th century, the age of uh, exploration, when the, uh, the British Victorian naturalist explorers, and a number of French also at about the same time, traveled around the world basically establishing the biogeography of the Earth, which species are where. Um, many of them uh, noted that there were species that, that, that clearly were introduced from one place and were found in a, a, another place. But only two of them talked at all about impact. For, for the great majority, it was all just about establishing which species are found where. The two who um, pointed to uh, impact, remember this was in a period when there was no field of ecology. The term hadn't even been coined at this time. The two who recognized uh, impact were Darwin and Wallace. Wallace, in particular, wrote about the devastating impact of some invasive species on islands. And Darwin wrote eloquently uh, in several places, and those who have read The Origin of Species may even remember uh, this passage. But in several places, he wrote about not only that they were present, but they were clearly having an ecological impact is how we would now frame it. So that was in the 19th century, but it didn't lead to any sustained study of introduced species or their impacts. They just wrote about it and that was the end of it for many, many years. It's often said that this wonderful book by Charles Elton, how many people here have read this? There must be yeah, quite a few. It's, it was, it's, it's based on uh, three BBC radio broadcasts written for a lay audience. It's unusual to have a, a book written for a lay audience like that um, adumbrate so many of the, of the critical issues that we now uh, recognize for introduced species. And it's often said that it founded the field, as you can see from this title or you know, from this caption. But actually, it didn't do that. Uh, he wrote it. A number of people read it at the time. It wasn't even reviewed in science journals. Um, and neither Elton's students nor other colleagues continued then to study introduced species. It, it, it just had no, no real impact. And it wasn't um, until a project in the 1980s that uh, really we saw the, the uh, initiation of the modern field of invasion biology. And that occurred with a meeting, we'd now call them working groups, they didn't call them that then in the 1980s, of an international organization, SCOPE, Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment. And the mission of SCOPE was to bring together scientists from all over the world to uh, address environmental problems or ecological problems. And, uh, they would often meet for three or four years, a series of workshops and publish books like these. And Scope, in, the, um, uh, in 1982, uh, actually initiated a project on invasive species as an ecological problem. This was really uh, spearheaded by Hal Mooney, uh, a, a professor at Stanford, some of you may may know Hal Mooney, he's still active and, uh, uh, and writes quite a bit. And uh, he and several others suggested that SCOPE should have a project on the environmental impacts of, of introduced species. And the governing board of SCOPE agreed and so they initiated this project which lasted for several years. Um, and it engaged many people. There were probably 150 or 200 scientists that took part in different workshops. It led to many books. There were uh, 
There was a North American book. There was one from Great Britain, one from Australia, one from South Africa, one from the Netherlands. There was a global synthesis volume. And uh, many of these people had not worked on particular invasions before, but they were sort of drawn into it because they worked in areas that were close to uh, invasions. They were mostly ecologists, some evolutionists. Um, and as you can see from this uh, announcement in the Scope newsletter, there were, they were supposed to do three things during this uh, period of, of about five years. One was to figure out why some species are invasive when they're introduced, and others either don't survive, or if they do, they don't become invasive. Uh, sort of the holy grail of invasion biology, uh, and has been for years. The second question was, why is it that some ecosystems seem particularly prone to invasion? Islands would be one example. Mediterranean-type ecosystems around the world, the Mediterranean, South Africa, California, Mediterranean area would be another. And then, of course, uh, because it was SCOPE, Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment, how could we bring the information gathered about these points to bear on how to manage them, how to do something about them. As it turns out, there were uh, about 10 books published basically from the scope proceedings and dozens of papers, but there was almost nothing on this on management. It was all about the various impacts that introduced species had and, uh, uh, and the ecosystems in which they they had them, and there was really very little about management. Okay. Uh, and about the next uh, 10 to 15 years, then, the 1990s, late 1980s, w w saw an explosion of research spurred really by the SCOPE project on particular invaders and their impacts on one or a small group of native species wherever they invaded. So a famous one would be the brown tree snake in Guam that's eliminated virtually all the forest birds of Guam. Snakes play a big role in this, <laughs> you know, but this is the snake du jour now, which is the, the Burmese python in, in Florida, which has uh, caused an over 90% decline in all the small and uh, all the medium and large sized mammals in uh, in the Everglades. And islands played a major role in this. There are many, many papers about the impacts of particular species on particular groups on islands. You know, so like here's uh, immigrant killers is about the mustelids, the weasels and the ferrets introduced to New Zealand and what they did. Reindeer on uh, South Georgia. Tim Lowe's book is about many different invaders and their particular impacts on on particular native species in Australia. Here's a similar volume on New Caledonia. Um, what else? Yeah, uh, John Randall in his talk today that many of you went to made the point that th there are islands that are not oceanic islands. They're, they're habitats, they're separated by large distances from similar habitats and lakes, of course, are, are aquatic. Islands. So the Nile perch, uh, sorry, the Nile perch in uh, Lake Victoria, is an example. Here's uh, one of the worst conservation disasters uh, in, in history. Here's a, a fish introduced to uh, Lake Victoria, which is the home of one of the great evolutionary radiations that we know of. Uh, about 300 species of endemic cichlids found only there. It, it ate most of them up. It caused over 200 species to go extinct. Here's a very good book and a very depressing documentary about it. Um, here's another case that I'll talk about again a little later. It's known as the killer alga that, that got into the Mediterranean uh, off France and spread around the near shore areas, changing habitat and causing many uh, species of animals to decline by replacing what had been seagrasses. Um, so that, that was sort of the, the flavor of research throughout the 
1990s and the beginning of this uh, century. And in the end, it, it, it created a catalog of impact of many different sorts. You know, showing introduced species, they eat native species, they compete with them, they infect them, they, uh, they vector disease to native species, hybridize with native species, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you were to ask, you know, what's new about the field, there's still a huge amount of research of this sort to be done. The great, as an example, in um, the United States, we believe that not counting microbes, there are around 6,000 or 7,000 introduced species. No more than about 1,500 of them have been substantially studied. So we really have no idea what many of the others are doing. And some of them are probably doing very consequential things. They may be subtle, but they may be very important. But they haven't. So there's a lot of this kind of work to be done. But if you were to ask what's new in the field, I think there are two main directions that are um, showing that impacts are far more pervasive and important than we had thought in explaining some of the reasons why certain invasions are more uh, consequential than others. Um, and the first is the idea of ecosystem-wide impacts. Uh, actually, during the scope conferences, Peter Vatusik of Stanford gave uh, both at the North American meeting and at the, uh, interne at the, the, the synthesis meeting at the end, a very interesting example. And he said, this is a different kind of impact. It's an ecosystem-wide impact. He was talking about uh, this, this plant, which is now Morella Faya. It's from the Atlantic. And the key thing that, that Peter pointed out was that it's a nitrogen-fixing plant on, on the young islands of Hawaii. And it, it, in the elevational range, there are no native uh, nitrogen fixing plants. So in the cities like Hilo, there are a sea of exotics in people's yards, but they couldn't invade into the nitrogen poor, the, the, the soil, the volcanic soil on the young island. And here you have a, uh, a plant that's fertilizing Hawaii and thereby you know, spurring uh, other invasions. As it turned out, Peter and his students and colleagues show that it's actually part of what we call an invasional meltdown. It's, it's not only the introduced plant itself, but the seeds are primarily dispersed by the uh, Japanese white eye, also introduced, and by pigs, also introduced, and all the earthworms are introduced, and they work the, 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 the uh, leaves into the litter, and they speed up by a factor of two to eight times the transformation of the nitrogen into a, a usable form by other plants. So he pointed all this out, or most of it. He didn't talk about the dispersal. But um, it's interesting that it, it was sort of a one-off at that time. All of us looked at it, and we all said, wow, that's pretty interesting. But it didn't lead to a, a lot of research of that sort until about 10 years later. And, and since then, there's been an explosion of research on other invaders that are affecting entire ecosystems, not just particular groups of species. And here's a really good example by another Stanford professor, Tad Fukami, who was, was my graduate student. He's now a faculty member at Stanford. And for his postdoc, Tad Fukami works with a group of scientists in New Zealand. And they looked at a series of islands, smaller islands around New Zealand, some of which had been invaded by rats, and some of which were still rat-free. And at the time they published this paper, uh, there were easily 100 papers on the impacts of rats on islands. I'm sure I had read 50 of them by that time. And every one of them was about the impact of rats on seabirds eliminating entire seabird colonies or rookeries or what have you. But what, what Fukami and his co-workers did was to look at all of the impacts of the rats, including the impact of the seabirds disappearing. And um, as an example of part of the paper, here they're just looking at the 
what we call the brown food web, the part of the uh, biotic community that's below ground. And in each case, the, um, each one of these is a different group of organisms. Chlemolins are springtails, you know, here's rotifers, et cetera, et cetera. And in each case, the bar on the left is for rat-free islands, and the bar on the right is for islands with rats. And you can see right away that, that for all of them there's a difference, and for most of them it's a very significant difference. So there's this huge impact on, on almost everything living below ground. That's just the below ground part. They also looked at the, at, at the above ground part. So their point was that the, the total impact of the rats was not just eliminating seabirds, that, that the, the direct impact of rats and the removal of the seabirds was leading to massive changes in the entire ecosystem. So the ecosystem impacts are one of the growing points of the field, in fact. And the other um, thing that's sort of new in the field, or relatively new, is uh, evolution and genetics and the role of evolution and genetics in uh, biological invasions. It's, it's an interesting fact that I don't understand, and some historian of science should be, be, be studying this, that uh, during the SCOPE conference, it, it, it crystallized a huge amount of ecological research. There were also evolutionists at the, immediately, like through the late 80s, early 90s. It's, um, but, but not very, very little work on evolution. Even though there were evolutionists at the scope, uh, in the scope project. And so this is the first monograph on uh, evolution and its relationship to biological invasion in 2004. But um, now, over the last decade, there's uh, just a huge amount of work on many aspects of um, of evolution, both of introduced species themselves and of native species in response to uh, introduced species. And, uh, you know, I could give several lectures on, on this kind of work, but I'll just point to two examples of the kind of um, information we now have. It, it, it had been sort of paradoxical, and it was even known as the the genetic paradox of invasions, that we think that, or we thought, that invasions generally begin with a few individuals of some species getting to a different place, you know, like a few rats climbing off a ship onto Santa Cruz Islands or Anacapa. Um, and the paradox is that it's a, 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 a dictum of of conservation biology that small populations are, uh, are threatened. And one of the main reasons they're threatened is for uh, genetic reasons, because very small populations, first of all, are uh, genetically depauperate, and genetic drift becomes very important, as well as inbreeding depression. And so the paradox was that we could see a number of invasions that were clearly very successful. The species spread and become, became uh, extremely important ecologically, in spite of the fact that they went through this bottleneck when the population was very small. And um, uh, sort of the resolution of a large part of the paradox has come from geneticists and evolutionists um, recognizing that many introductions are actually multiple introductions happening over and over again, even from different sources. This is the first paper that made a big splash of that sort, also in 2004, by Jonathan Colby and his co-workers. And here's looking at the Cuban anole, which also known as the brown anole. Those of you who have been in Miami or anywhere in South Florida have surely seen it. It's largely replaced the native green anole in, in Florida. And here they were looking at mitochondrial haplotypes, my, mitochondrial genes. And what they showed was in Cuba, which is the native range of the species, in any one place, uh, almost all of the individuals were of one haplotype or, or a very few very similar haplotypes, so not diverse. But almost everywhere they looked in Florida, there was a variety of haplotypes. 
And so it's very clear that there were multiple introductions from all over Cuba into Florida. The other, uh, you know, and so far from being genetically depauperate, the Florida populations are genetically rich and uh, would not be expected to suffer inbreeding depression and drift. It also showed that the subsequent invasions of Hawaii and Grand Cayman and Taiwan almost certainly came from Florida, not from Cuba, because they, again, have a diversity of haplotypes. Um, oops. Yeah, another important finding, increasingly obvious over the, uh, this last decade, is that there's a massive amount of hybridization, both between introduced species and related native species, and between different populations of introduced species. And sometimes this turns out to be critically important in making a, an invasion a really important one with huge impact. Here's a, a very good example, reed canary grass, one of our worst wetland invaders in the world. And what uh, Laverne and Olofsky showed is that, that the invasive genotypes are actually hybrids of, uh, uh, of, of parents from, from different parts of the European range. And they did enough genetic work to show even which gene systems are involved, and, and no one of their parental strains is itself highly invasive, but the various hybrids of these are, are causing this massive invasion of North America. So I could give many other examples, but that's this, these are the sorts of things that um, the engagement of evolutionists and geneticists in invasion biology have been able to show. Now a little history. This is the second California Island Symposium that I've been at. In 1994, I was uh, here, I was in Santa Barbara, uh, for the fourth one. And it's, it's interesting to compare these. There were 49 talks at that one. There was one plenary talk, my talk. And we, we met in one big room. <laughs> there were not parallel sessions. In this meeting, I counted 200 different talks, and uh, I forget how many posters, but anyway, it's a very different sort of thing. And um, what I talked about was uh, the fragility of island ecosystems. And I talked about m many different factors that make island ecosystems particularly fragile. And about a third of my talk was about introduced species. Um, and I talked about uh, examples from around the world on islands of introduced species eating native species, competing with native species. I gave several examples of um, introduced species hybridizing with native species. It's interesting that what I didn't talk about at all was what to do about it. I, I said not a word <laughs> about whether we could do anything about it or managing how to manage them. Um, I had participated in the scope conferences, and uh, this was pretty soon after that, and I guess you know, I was doing what they did in the scope conferences, which is talk about impacts. And I said nothing whatsoever about how we can do, whether we should, well, I, by implication, we should not introduce them. But I didn't talk at all about what to do about them uh, when they're there. However, of the 49 talks, there were actually a whole bunch on introduced species. There were 10 of the 49 talk were about introduced species, and almost all of them were about what to do about it, trying to manage them. So the, the Channel Islands were, were really in the vanguard of, you know, I, I went to other conferences in the 90s that were all about invasions, and I remember one I went to um, in Europe where there were about 150 talks and only two on doing anything about it. it was all, all the 148 were about about the invasion. So this, this was very different. And there were talks about uh, you know, trying to eradicate sheep and goats, um, pigs, fennel, even honeybees, which no one else was talking about uh, at that time. Um, so that, that's, that's very interesting. And I, I, I read through these again 22 years later, um, and I learned quite, <laughs> quite a bit. There's also a lesson. Um, that's really important 
for um, managing introduced species and trying to predict what some management uh, uh, procedure will lead to. I guess it's sort of the unintended consequences idea. There was this paper about um, what would be the impact of removing the, uh, the sheep and cattle from Santa Cruz. And the concern was, how's it going to affect the fox and the, and the skunk? And um, this paper laid out the hypothesis. I don't, I, I don't mean to pick. I mean, it was perfectly well-reasoned. And but it, it's sort of interesting. The, the general thought was it would really be um, not a problem for the fox at all, but the skunk might be severely threatened because of habitat destruction by introduced pig pop by increased pig populations. And there, there was nothing about the possibility of, of, of the pigs subsidizing a predator, in this case the golden eagle, that would drive the fox population down, which in turn would, would facilitate the, the skunk. So, um, you know, there are many examples in the history of managing introduced species where things just don't turn out the way you, uh, you might have predicted. And I, I guess it's just an example of the kind of thing that, that, um, that Gretchen showed in her plenary talk earlier today about the, the tremendous complexity of systems where each species is interacting with many other species and with the physical environment. And you, you do the best you can to predict what's going to happen, but there, there are going to be things that you just won't be able to predict, and that turned out to be one of them. Um, okay, so uh, I guess the rest of my talk, I want, want to, in spite of the fact that there is this explosion of research on introduced species, and especially beginning in this century on managing them in different ways, um, there have been a series of fairly high profile papers and a couple books saying it's, it's really a hopeless cause, that the forces of globalization are arrayed against us and that the best we can do is maybe to slow down the process of invasion and so maybe we, we shouldn't really bother. And it's captured very eloquently in this um, quote from a paper in Science Magazine in 2011 by Mark Gardner, who at that time was the director of Darwin Research Station. It's time to embrace the aliens. Blackberries, he's talking about this species here, um, are now, now cover more than 30,000 hectares here. Our studies show that island biodiversity is reduced by at least 50%, but as far as I'm concerned, it's now a Galapagos native. It's time we accepted it as such. So we can't do anything about it, so we should stop spending money trying to do that. As it happened, um, that was, I mean, I think he's very, very wrong, and I'll explain why. In that particular case, he's almost certainly wrong. This is the paper from which he drew that information. And he, so there were 30 attempts to eradicate plant, invasive plant species in the Galapagos. Only four of them were, um, were successful. Um, and one that wasn't was blackberries. This is a very recent paper that says, actually, that's not right. There are only 21 attempts. Eight of them have been successful. And several of the others probably will be if they continue funding them. So there's some debate about his original premise. But um, more generally, there, there are lots and lots of success stories. Island Conservation is this wonderful NGO. I'm on the board of it, so I have to plug it now. Um, and it's, you know, many of you know about it. It's, it's, it's raison d'etre is to eradicate invasive vertebrates, originally on islands in the Gulf of California, but now all over the world, wherever they threaten native uh, diversity. And so far, it's eradicated 72 populations of various combinations of rats, cats, sheep, mice, pigs, goats, burrows. Greg, what am I forgetting? There's two or three other, <laughs> you know. Uh, and on 53 islands around the world. It was increasingly challenging projects with uh, 
increasing success. And this is just part of um, a larger trend. This is a database that's been um, constructed, the, um, the DICE database, and um, for vertebrate eradications on islands around the world. And as you can see, by 2013, there have been almost uh, about 900 of them. 31 different mammals have been eradicated from several hundred islands around the world and eight, eight birds. I mean, the uh, California islands are part of this. For the California islands as a whole, there have been 50 populations of, uh, of um, 20 species of uh, vertebrates eradicated from, a, no, of a, a, a 12 species eradicated from about 20 islands. For the Channel Islands, there are 30 populations have been eradicated uh, of, of 10 species, been eradicated from various of, all eight islands have had eradications. And that's just part of the big international story. Here are some very notable ones, like rats. These are the biggest islands that certain groups have been, uh, or certain species have been eradicated. So Macquarie and Campbell are very large islands. They're about half the size of Santa Cruz islands. And uh, rats have been eradicated. Goats have been eradicated from um, Isabella, which is about the size of uh, Delaware. You know. And there, there are other you know, really major success stories. Another interesting thing is that the proportion of projects that succeeds has consistently increased from the 1960s. And th there are more and more complex projects being undertaken with increasing success. So for example, almost 300 of over 1,000 attempts were parts of, um, of, of 125 multi-species projects. The biggest one I know is in New Zealand, where there's one project where they removed eight different mammals from, um, from, from one island. Also, there's increasing uh, eradication projects with increasing success on islands inhabited by humans. So lots of things that looked intractable as recently as 15 or so years ago are now coming you know, well within range of being feasible. And there, there are huge impacts uh, for conservation. This is a, uh, a very recent paper for some of these eradications documenting the conservation consequences. And, um, you can easily you know, read the whole paper. But it, it, it basically shows that at least this, this group that they looked at of 251 eradications had enormous cons uh, conservation benefits. Um, and I, I have to mention what, uh, what I think is maybe the most uh, you know, dramatic and challenging project. Predator Free New Zealand was announced about a year ago. It's a project that the New Zealand government is supporting uh, that aims by the year 2050 to have eradicated all the introduced predators, predatory mammals, from the main islands of New Zealand. So for, the, for them, we're talking about um, you know, ferrets and weasels, rats, and the, uh, and the brush-tailed possum. And, uh, it's, it's, it's a well-funded project, and if anyone can do it, probably New Zealanders can. And um, it, it's, it's, it's really galvanized interest among conservation biologists and invasion biologists worldwide. You can go to the, Google it, and you'll, you'll read about it. Um, yeah, and IUCN has sponsored these two uh, symposia on eradication of uh, introduced species on islands, not just of vertebrates and not just of mammals, but there's, there's papers in here about plants and insects. I'll refer to these again, but there are many, and these are both online, so you can just read the stories. And they're almost all success stories. That, that's the important point. They, they almost all have been successful. Some have had unintended subsequent consequences but they, they generally did eradicate the targeted organisms. Um, for different, there's, there's no, unlike the DICE database for 
vertebrates on iWINS. There's no, no uh, um, global database for other groups of species, but you can extract the data from some of them. GERDA is a database of, of many eradications, especially arthropods, so insects, and plant pathogens. As you can see, it, it documents the, uh, the uh, outcomes of 970 eradication campaigns and many things. And you can go down their, uh, to their website, you can extract for islands, and there are 16, they're all insects actually, 16 insects have been the targets of 54 eradication campaigns. And um, of the known outcomes, about two thirds have been successful. And it's very interesting to look at the history of these. The earlier ones, uh, this is, I believe, the second oldest successful eradication of citrus black fly. Many of these were targets because they were either of agricultural consequence or human health. This, I think, was the second oldest. And it was on a small island, Key West. Many of you, or some of you, have probably been there. And it took four years, and it involved a massive, massive use of chemicals and broad spectrum chemicals that killed just about everything. Um, and this is the way it was through the 40s and 50s. Um, but uh, in the mid 50s, Edward Nippling, who um, was an entomologist with the USDA, uh, developed the idea of using sterile males. And the idea would be if you could somehow create, using either chemis chemicals or radiation, sterile males and release them in great number, the females could only mate with them and then they wouldn't have offspring and it could cause the population to crash. And, and he proved it, or a team uh, that he uh, led proved it on the island of Curacao, which is a pretty big, pretty big island, 444 square kilometers. By, they eradicated screwworms by using the sterile male technique. And since then, even bigger islands have had insects totally eradicated <laughs> by using sterile male. So the, the oriental fruit fly on Guam, the melon fly on the entire Ryukyu archipelago, including Okinawa and Amami Ocean, which are huge, huge islands. Um, and it, the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, their main function nowadays is to irradiate <laughs> insects for use in eradication campaigns, some on islands, most of them on the mainland, and you know, they've published these two books on using the technique. So it's a, a very different sort of thing, eradicating insects now, than it was uh, you know, in the 30s and 40s. And it's interesting. Um, in the Goethe database, there are no other examples other than this one from the Channel Islands, where the honeybee, which is one of the worst invasive insects, has actually been eradicated. And it was erratic. This is the, a report from an earlier one of the island symposia about how they did it. Um, they did it, but they, they introduced a parasitic mite, which helped. But it basically involved um, knowing enough about the bee to find all its colonies and eliminate them. And they got rid of every last one. For ants, there's a recent publication documenting all the ant eradication campaigns around the world. Seventy of them were on islands, and about half of those were successful. And those who went to Christina Bozer's talk two days ago heard the update on uh, the Argentine ant eradication campaign on Santa Cruz. She didn't mention something of interest that, that makes it even a more magnificent uh, project and a more challenging one. That is the, the explosion of fennel after removal of the livestock led to a, um, an invasional meltdown because it led to a great increase in scale insects on the fennel. And the Argentine ant takes honeydew from the scale insects. And it, it's, uh, it's helped them <laughs> to maintain their, their colonies. This, is, this has happened with other ant invasions. Probably the best known ant invasion is the yellow crazy ants that got into uh, on Christmas Island in the Indian ocean, and it was in the process of, of actually eliminating totally the famous red crab of, of Christmas Island. But uh, you know what's not too well known is that actually the crazy ant was there even in the 19th 
century. Um, and it wasn't widespread, it wasn't very numerous, and didn't have any obvious impact on the red crab. And it was only in the late 1980s that suddenly these super colonies arose and began killing all the crabs. And that was because a scale insect, an exotic scale insect, was introduced to Christmas Islands from somewhere, and it produced honeydew that, that the yellow crazy ant used, and that's what led to the explosion. So the, the uh, Santa Cruz case is just another example of, of the interaction of scale insects with ants that, that makes ant eradication both important and very, very challenging. Um, one interesting observation is that, uh, that as far as eradication goes, plant eradications lag way behind animals. If you look at the two IUCN documents, you, you can see the uh, difference. This is the recent one, 2011, 129 er successful eradication campaigns against animals, eight against plants. There's, there's quite a bit of pessimism about plant eradication. There was this um, paper from the 2002, the first IUCN Island Symposium by Marcel Rajmanik and by uh, Pitcairn, basically saying it's really very, very hard and probably can't be done other than on a very small island because of seed bank in the soil. And, um, you know, that fits in very well with Gardner's statement about we may as well give up for most plants on the Galapagos. But actually, there have been a number of eradications of plants despite the seed bank in the soil. They all involve real persistence. Um, even in the 2002 IUCN Symposium, there was this, this uh, paper by Beth Flint on um, sand burr and eradicating it from Waysan Island. And they got rid of every last one by going back and looking for the, the, uh, the, the newly germinating seeds in the soil. Um, cochia was introduced deliberately as a pasture plant to Western Australia. They realized pretty soon that they'd made a bad mistake, but by then it, it covered thousands of hectares over uh, you know, 800 kilometers, but they set to work primarily with herbicides and they eventually got rid of every last individual and it's no longer in Australia. And I mentioned the killer alga, Calerpa taxifolia, before because this is one of the real great triumphs of marine um, invasion management. It was eradicated from uh, two sites in California, in Carlsbad and uh, Huntington Harbor. And there's this brand new book all about the eradication of Calerpa taxifolia. The key here was getting on it right away without waiting to see if it was going to be a problem. Um, and that's been a, a, a major hindrance to more eradication. Often uh, authorities wait to see if they think it's going to be a problem before committing the resources to eradicate it. Uh, and of course, by the time it's recognized as a problem, it's spread and it makes it much more challenging. Um, I got an update uh, yesterday from John about the Santa Cruz Island plant eradication program. There's now 32 species targeted out of about 100 non-native species of plants, and they have about 2,000 populations. And uh, a major point of this paper and, and of his talk, if you went to it, was that the use of a helicopter has, has greatly facilitated the project. And you know, now they can use paint guns to mark them, and they can drop John on face cliffs so that he can show off and get rid of them. Um, but you know, it's, it's something that couldn't have been done without it. And I believe they've eradicated three species already. Maybe there's more now. Um, I, I also you know, should point to some really notable eradications that, that would have uh, seemed impossible if people hadn't actually done them. So the black striped mussel from the Caribbean is uh, closely related to the zebra mussel. It's very, very similar biology. It got into um, Cullen Bay, which is an arm of Darwin Harbor in um, 
1999. It was probably found within about six months of its arrival when it was spread out in a few patches over several hectares. And within nine days of, of discovering it, the Australians, knowing about the zebra mussel, had cordoned off the bay. They poisoned the bay with uh, gallons and gallons of bleach and a huge amount of copper sulfate, killing every living thing in the bay. All the native species have planktonic larvae, and all but, I believe, one have since recolonized. They also tracked all 200 boats that had been in Cullen Bay uh, that year, up to about six months previously. They found every single one of those boats and checked their hulls to make sure they, hadn't, they didn't have the black stripe muscle, and it's never been seen again. So it's really a, a, a very successful project that undoubtedly avoided a huge disaster. And some of you may have seen that rinder pest was eradicated from the face of the earth. Not only the invasive introduced population in Africa, but even in Asia, the native population. Um, and all this is just about eradication. The, uh, a, a, a number of these you know, pessimistic arguments that, well, we can't do anything about it, so let's give up act as if if you don't eradicate it, you've lost the battle, there's nothing you can do about it. And it's simply not true. There are many examples of what I call maintenance management, most of them using you know, these three techniques, either biological control, chemical control, or various physical and mechanical means that, that, that can keep introduced populations at a low enough level so that they're not ecologically problematic. And, um, you know, each one of these is, uh, has its own peculiarities, but there are hundreds and hundreds of successful examples. One that I uh, watched very closely, I was in Florida for 29 years. I was at Florida State University, and I worked a lot in South Florida. And in the 1970s and 80s, and 1960s even, Australian paper bark, uh, got into Florida, and it was viewed as an intractable disaster. It's pyrogenic, so it would catch fire from lightning. It would burn through the sawgrass and muley grass meadows, killing all the native species. And then it, you know, it, would, it would grow in from these called paper bark heads, and it would just completely change the landscape. And no one had any idea what to do about it. And, um, and, and this went on for about 10 years. But people didn't give up. They kept working at it, and over the last uh, 15 or 20 years, there's, there's been uh, really major progress. And it wasn't one silver bullet, you know, it was just getting better and better at various things they've been trying, plus clever use of prescribed fires at certain times of the year. And actually, the, the most recent um, estimate I've seen was from 2013. It's down to about 9% of of that part of South Florida. So it's, it's definitely going to be controlled. And it would have seemed intractable if someone had told me 25 years ago we could control Mel Luke, I would, have, I would never have bet on it. Um, another example, sea lamprey, which got in, in the early 20th century into the Great Lakes. And it caused the extinction of at least three fish species and devastated many other native fish species. For years, it was controlled more or less uh, by lamprecides and by dams. Uh, until a, uh, an endocrinologist and behaviorist, uh, Peter Sorensen at the University of Minnesota, uh, deduced from just observing its biology that the larvae must be emitting a pheromone that allows the adults to find the stream where the larvae are. It's, the thing about the sea lamprey is that uh, of, of 50 or so streams going into a, a large lake, Year after year, it only uses about four of them. <laughs> and the others, it never goes up. And from that, he figured out it must be the larvae are doing this by emitting a pheromone. And he proved it by just using water from, from uh, larvae and it attracted them. And then we collaborated with biochemists to characterize the active agent, and then they synthesized it. And uh, a tiny amount of this attracts every sea lamprey within a medium-sized lake. Since then, there's also been work on sex pheromones 
that attracts the, uh, the male to the female. So it's a totally different way of, of doing things. It's a really new technology. Um, another example is zebra mussels, which, you know, of course, have been a, a disaster not only in North America, but also in Europe. And uh, this, this uh, group of people works on, uh, on micro beads for industry. The two, uh, not the first author, but the other two. And they had the idea of creating micro. The problem with, with zebra mussel is it's acutely sensitive to any toxin in the water. So as soon as you dump something in the water that would kill it, it closes its mouths and doesn't filter anymore until it's dissipated. So what they did was they, they created these microbeads of potassium chloride, which is toxic to it, but they coated it with a fatty substance. And so the zebra mussel doesn't know that it's um, toxic and it, it ingests a huge number of, of them and then the, the, uh, the fatty coating dissolves and they die. You can't use it in nature because the same thing happens to native mollusks, but it's widely used in Europe now in uh, municipal and industrial water supply situations. And, and my, my point is it's not something anyone had thought about until someone from a totally different uh, field, you know, of these industrial microbeads was talking at dinner, apparently, with David Aldrich, who's a, uh, an ecologist, and came up with this possibility. Um, the new kid on the block that, that I think may well transform uh, management and maybe eradication is genetics, and it's become controversial pretty quickly. Some genetic ideas are not hereditary. That is, they use genetics, but they won't be passed on to subsequent generations, so it's not quite as controversial. One is using gene silencing, which interferes with transcription. So it either ends up destroying the messenger RNA or rendering it useless. And there are several projects around the world to try to use gene silencing to control invasive species, both plants and animals. This one is project on uh, Phragmites. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not inherited, and so I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't heard any objections to it. The objections come with when we're talking about heritable uh, things. So here's a, a genetically modified mosquito you've all read about, the Oxytec mosquito. This is a transgene, so it comes from another species. And the way the Oxytec mosquito works is um, the, the transgene renders the um, it, it, it's, it's lethal to the mosquito that has it unless there's tetracycline in the environment. So they rear them in, in a tetracycline-rich environment and they're fine. Then they release, they can separate the males and females. They release the males and um, they mate with wild-type females, passing on the gene and all of the offspring die. And of course it, um, Immediately, people began to be very worried about the possibility of non-target organisms. You know, is, is it a stable construct? Could it get into some other species of mosquito? Somehow, what about the possibility of some unintended consequence of not having any mosquitoes? And um, it's very, very controversial. But, but you know, with the advent of the Zika virus, no one's paying any attention to that concern. They've now been released. Uh, by the gazillion in Piracicaba, Brazil, apparently working quite well. It's knocked back the mosquito population about 90 percent. They've been released in two places in, in Asia. And, and you know that you can't stop this at this point when a, uh, a, 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 one of the leading biotech venture capitalists just bought Oxytech. You know, so it's going to keep happening. But, th but that's a relatively primitive <laughs> GMO. It's, it's, a, it's a transgene and it, they, they, they produce the mosquito by massive trial and error, apparently. The really new kid on the block is, is uh, gene drives, RNA-guided gene drives, especially CRISPR-Cas9. There were earlier gene drives, some of which are still being worked, and recognized um, immediately 
that among the many things you could do with gene drives would be control invasive species, and these are all sort of parts of it. Um, and it was also recognized immediately by a number of people that that could solve you know, some of these island invasions. So island conservationists partners with North Carolina State University and Texas A&M University to see if it would be possible to use a, 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 a dream drive, CRISPR-Cas9, to get rid of mice on, um, on the Farallons. And some of you may have read this article in Bay Nature earlier this year about how some people don't like this. There, there's, there's a lot of concern about it. Something I'll point out with respect to the controversy is that um, no matter what we say about how it should be regulated, this, this train has left the station. This is an ad that appears in science every week now. It's a, it's a pullout that you can get. And, uh, it reminds me of, um, of when polymerase chain reaction, PCR, was first you know, discovered and publicized. And everyone thought, wow, what, what can we do with this? But it's hard to do. Within about four years, you could be doing it in your garage almost. And you know, here they're telling you, you can knock out any gene just by our kit. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that within a decade and probably much less, it'll be very, very easy for people to use this in lots of different ways. Um, the people that have been promoting the use of gene drives for many purposes, including uh, you know, medical as well as environmental, are, are all very clear that it's something that should be done with great caution and uh, we should think very carefully about how we're doing it. Certainly, the eth because this is heritable. It's not like gene silencing, it will be passed on. And so you'd be potentially changing a species and maybe eliminating species. Um, those of you who were at the, um, the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii last month know that there was a, a, a widely publicized uh, statement by a group of prominent conservationists saying we should never ever use this for any conservation purpose, including Jane Goodall, David Suzuki, et cetera, um, that's just too dangerous. Um, on the other hand, at almost the same time, the US National Research Council released this, um, this full study of the whole issue. You can get it online for free from National Research Council. And it says um, we should just proceed with caution and think very carefully about how we're using it, but we should proceed to investigate how to use it. Okay, the last uh, point that I'll talk about, maybe because it will have particular uh, resonance here in the Channel Islands, is that whenever we're dealing with, um, uh, especially a mammal, but occasionally uh, with birds, there's, uh, for eradication campaign and some management, there's almost always some objection based on either animal welfare or animal rights um, objections. It's, it's come to a, sort of a, a tragic end in Europe where the, our uh, gray squirrel was, was uh, it escaped from a park in uh, Italy and began to spread um, northward in Italy. And because this squirrel has pretty much eliminated the native red squirrel from large parts of Great Britain already. There's a, a long history of understanding how it works. It, it transmits a disease that the red squirrel is, um, uh, is very susceptible to, but it is resistant to, and a squirrel pox, it's called. And in addition, it outcompetes the, the um, red squirrel. So the Italian government immediately began an eradication campaign to get rid of it, which was working, but it was stopped in its tracks by a lawsuit by an animal rights group in Italy, and the Supreme Court of Italy upheld the, uh, the uh, uh, plaintiffs, and so it was stopped, and it's now reached uh, the French border, and it's also spreading northward to, um, to uh, Switzerland. Um, well, and of course, you know, here we have the famous, I don't know, how, how many have read When the Killing's Done here? 
I thought there'd be a lot of people here that did. You know, it captured very well exactly what happened with Anna Kappa and Santa Cruz. You know, when you look closely at these, I, the animal welfare and animal rights community is not a homogeneous mess. You know, there, there are different concerns. They're, they're not all exactly the same, but a, a good part of it comes down for many of them to the rights of species or populations to exist versus the rights of individual animals to exist, or at the very least to have hu humane death or sterilization. And so, you know, groups in the U.S. that, and in Europe, PETSA is very active also. So this, this always is an issue. I think with the, um, the genetic approaches and these other mechanisms, that sort of controversy um, you know, can be addressed by scientific evidence and by experience and by you know, careful consideration of possible consequences. I, this is a, 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 an issue of a different order. It's almost like a religious argument. And I, you know, no matter what science is brought to bear, it's not going to be able to resolve this kind of a concern. But with respect to um, all of the other arguments that we can't do anything about it or we shouldn't waste the money, et cetera, I think, they'll, um, I think they can be dispensed with by showing the public what's at stake and by publicizing the fact that we really can do something about it. There are a whole bunch of ways in which we can attack this problem. There have been many success stories and we should, we should try to replicate them. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it, but I'll take questions. Thank you.